is um, the bats. So some of these events that we're going to talk about were easily observable and some of them were not very easily observable. So in a few cities in Texas, we had some highly observable bat mortalities. Most of this was tied to human made structures where the bats were living in them, probably not really natural situations. Um, for example, in Victoria, we had six locations, um, all overpasses, bridges, man-made structures, uh, and out of, and we had about um, 8,600 bats that we counted and recorded for, that, that we experienced mortality with. And, and two of those structures accounted for most of that mortality. Um, this was probably much more widespread than was observed. There's bat colonies under many overpasses and bridges across the state. Some of them are unknown. And um, a lot of it probably went undocumented. Here in this area, um, I went to a few bridges in that time frame that I knew had um, bat colonies. And in this area, I only found one or two individual bats under, under one bridge. Um, and for these colonies, finding one or two individuals isn't that uncommon, dead individuals underneath these colonies. So I did not really attribute this to um, any mortality from the freeze or anything extraordinary. However, I was only able to get to a handful of, of bridges in, in these counties during that time frame. And with all of these things, as time goes by, the days, the weeks go by, the evidence of any mortality or effects becomes harder to farce out from what you're seeing um, or might be harder to detect. So that was, you know, these bat mortalities in some of these areas were a lot easier to observe, but our bat populations in our natural caves um, in Texas and in natural areas withstood this freeze a lot better. Um, we did not see really any mortality in a lot of these populations, mainly because inside of these caves or natural areas, um, the population is much more state or the temperature is much more stable and did not fluctuate as much. It's protected and uh, much more than some of these man-made structures. Um, you know, one thing we did see um, quite a bit of and made a lot of news was the fish kills along the coast. Uh, we estimate we lost around 3.8 million fish. Um, around 91% of that is non-game. So that was fish like silver perch, hardhead catfish, anchovy, striped mullet. Um, so not typically game fish or the fish most people, that, that's on most people's radar. However, a lot of these are um, fish that many other larger fish rely on for food. Um, and so they, they are important to the system. Um, of the game fish, the speckled trout were the hardest hit. Um, you kind of see in this photograph kind of depicts there's a few game species laying there, but most of the other things are shad and perch um, and um, anchovies. And so that's kind of depicts a little bit of what we saw. And with the game fish, um, to kind of address this loss in population, um, we're changing the fishing regulations. We did change them after the freeze and we're trying to target um, some older age classes and increase our brood stock and take the pr pressure off of some of our brood stock in, in the bays and estuaries. We're trying to give the fish a break. So we reduced our slot limits and re we reduced the number of fish people could keep in their daily bag limit to try and, uh, you know, keep a few more fish out there in the water. Um, we expect that recovery to take about two to three years to get us back to where we were. Um, and we've uh, worked on a 27% increase in spawning stock biomass. Um, a lot of these kills maybe went unreported, um, but some, you know, were highly observable but we can never know exactly the full extent. Um, we do have trend data in all of our um, bays in Texas where our fisheries division 
um, uses sampling nets and different means to estimate the populations. And, you know, we're, we're seeing about, uh, I think a 20, 30% decrease in those populations after that. Um, but, but we do expect most of this to recover. Um, you know, locally, we did not see large fish kills. Most of the water we hear is in our lakes and that we have here is in our lakes and rivers and ponds. And a lot of those have deeper areas that are have a more constant temperature and we're shielded from that extreme cold weather. And we didn't see as much die offs. Um, you know, one that I did have reported was in Lake Gonzales. There's a, there was an oxbow lake in Lake Gonzales and a few, uh, a week or two after the event, some of them reported that there were carp and alligator gar, um, um, floating there and, and, uh, quite a bit of state of decomposition. But I think that one, you know, was, was hard to document because, uh, it wasn't found till later. Um, and and now the dam at Lake Gonzales broke, um, so that Oxbow Lake is no longer there. Um, for our birds, um, the event was typically very widespread, and once again, the theme was very hard to document. Um, we think it was probably not significant for, for most species. However, um, you know, we did see instances of, of individuals or multiple individuals, um, mortality widespread throughout the state. And so, you know, for example, um, for our white wing and mourning doves. We do have a banding effort where we trap and ban doves throughout the um, well in the year. And so we can follow them. And when they're found dead or reported by hunter harvest, um, we can track, you know, where those doves move and how long they live. And so in that process of trapping this past year, um, we've noticed several of the birds um, that we trapped uh, a portion of them had frostbite, you know, and you see the upper right picture where the dove lost part of its bill. That was fairly, I would say common, but we saw that multiple times. And you can see on the bottom right hand corner of the dove that had lost part of its toe from frostbite as well. And, and throughout the hunting season as well, we had hunters reporting this to us time and time again. Um, some as high as 10 uh, to 20% of the doves in hand had some frostbite or, or something like that in some areas. Um, we, we do expect the overall impact to, to be small in most of, of Texas and probably even smaller in northern Texas where they're used to these colder climates. Um, the white winged doves were probably impacted more because they're typically a southern species just a couple decades ago. They were mostly only found along the Texas-Mexico border in deep south Texas in the valley, and they've expanded northward over the last couple decades um, all the way up in north Texas. And so this is more of a um, warmer climate southern species that's expanding northward, and we, we saw probably more mortality with them. However, our surveys um, that we've conducted this past year we're within the recent averages. So um, we had 25 million mourning doves was our statewide estimate and 12 million white wing doves our statewide estimate. And so that, that's kind of right around our, our average number that we count. Although the, the last previous years, we did have some of our highest numbers as well. So that might may have buffered us um, some as well. <clears throat> for songbirds, um, I think this is this is another one that was really hard to estimate. Um, you know, we did have photos like this come to us. These were a bunch of um, um, eastern bluebirds, the males that were early, early migrants starting to set up their territories and starting to build nests for the year. And um, 
you know, they came a little too early with this storm and you can see where a bunch of them piled in to try to protect themselves from the cold weather into this bluebird box. Um, so, you know, we did see some of this. Um, we did see large, I wouldn't say large scale, but widely distributed um, mortality, but it was one or two individuals here, one or two individuals there. And um, it was hard to document, you know, I'll, I'll plug this a little bit later, but we did set up, um, I believe it's an iNaturalist um, account or, or, or app for this, where people could try to document the, so we tried to use a citizen science approach um, to get people to document what they were seeing. Unfortunately, just like us, um, just like the biologist and everybody else, um, Everybody was trying to survive themselves at that time, and most people didn't have spare time to uh, go document um, a couple birds on their doorstep. Um, a lot of our later migrants were probably not as affected as much. It was mostly just these early migrants that we saw that were mostly affected. And we, we did see some things like American robins and a few other species as well. Most of the species that we saw had more robust populations, but you know, we got photos or accounts of there were two or three robins or whatever of this songbird in the bushes. And if you don't go look in the bush, in every bush, you can't count those, those occurrences. And so some of those were hard to observe and not widely documented. But we did get, you know, uh, a little reasonable amount of effort documented off of that app across the state. Um, one thing that you may have seen on the news were the reptiles. Um, along the Texas coast, um, we had a lot of sea turtles who had issues with the cold. Um, a lot of times what happens is their metabolism slows down so much that they basically let themselves float to the surface and they kind of hang out there um and hoping that it warms up soon enough where they can get going again but a lot of times um you know they they fall victim to predators or they succumb to the elements and so it's been a wide practice when we have these events for uh volunteer organizations state and federal agencies to try to collect as many as they can put them in warming facilities and um, try to get them rehabilitated for a few days before their release and this year um, they found over 13,000 different spe or different turtles. Um, it was a very large effort to rehabilitate them. Unfortunately, only about one third of those survived. Um, but, you know, there's a good chance that that number would have been even more bleak if, um, that large effort would not have been made. Um, some of these species, um, are highly endangered or have uh, very limited populations. Um, I think the jury is still out on how much it affected the populations. I think overall they are looking at it as a setback, but not a detriment to these populations. Um, for mammals, for the most part, we did not have um, um, large scale problems with mammals dying. Mammals typically have fur, um, can find places to get out of the elements. Um, we did have reports of a few raccoons or small mammals or things here and there that came to the freeze. Um, we had few to almost no white tails, um, although we did have some that were in environments that were stressful, some overpopulated areas where we lost whitetails. The big thing that we saw a lot was um, a lot of the exotic ungulates like fallow deer, axis, nelgai, a lot of your species that come from Africa and Asia and warmer climates that we've released across Texas had a huge problem with the cold. A lot of it was due just because their species not adapted to that cold of weather and could not handle it. Their coats aren't as thick metabolism, whatever the mechanisms are, they can't handle the cold very well. Um, the other, you know, part to that was a lot of these animals um, where we saw these die-offs were found in areas that had really high populations and were over overcrowded. 
and the resources were limited. They didn't have the fat reserves they needed. A few of the um, exotic animal that um, that we dissected and the, the ones I looked at had no body fat at all on them. So if they're going into this extreme event with no body fat and they're not adapted for that climate, you know, they, they had a pretty rough time. Um, um, so other than that, you know, we, other than the exotics, we didn't see just too much effect on our native mammal population. Um, <clears throat> as far as insects, um, you know, eggs and pupa seem to survive. Um, the honeybees, from what I understand, came through Uri without big die-offs, although it seems like some of the, from what I've talked to some beekeepers, some of their populations or their colonies um, were kind of reduced in size. I talked to some beekeepers that had to uh, feed their honeybees a lot more this year than what they were expecting. Uh, and, um, you know, we also saw some insects, some wasp species, some cicadas, some other species that have, for the past decade or two, experienced, <coughs> excuse me, um, northern range expansions and were typically considered more southern species. And we saw those species more affected. And we expect to have to see some of their ranges pushed back further south again. And it might take some while before their ranges expand further north. Um, but most, however, were mildly affected and a lot of insects can deal with freezing um, temperatures fairly well. Um, but, you know, just as the songbirds and other animals are not well documented, the insects are probably highly overlooked um, for most people. Um, and there was little documentation for this. Um, anecdotally, it, it seems like, you know, going through at least the first part of the year, we did have kind of a reduced insect abundance and on, on a lot of areas that I saw. But the good thing about insects is that they're, um, species that reproduce quickly and in large numbers and a lot of times can overcome some setbacks like this. Um, something that was very interesting to a lot of people was the effect we saw on larger trees and shrubs. Now, we satch is kind of considered as a species that's been expanding across the state and probably northward for a while. Um, and in this area, um, there was a large portion that were top killed and damaged, but some of them actually re-sprouted. And if you, it, it was really amazing to us that to see, it almost looked like somebody um, used chemicals to, to kill some of these um, species because they were affected so readily, especially we satch. Um, we're guessing approximately 25% were killed in this area. Um, you know, it, it was very interesting to me as you drive around and look at the countryside, there are pastures that are completely nuked and all of the mature we satch are dead from the freeze. They never recovered. And the pasture right next door, the trees recovered and, and look fine. And there's some like in this top photograph um, where the top of the plant of the tree died and then it's re-sprouting from the roots. Um, after that. So, um, to be honest, with this invasive species, I was hoping for a little bit more effect, but I think there'll be localized setbacks, but it won't drastically uh, affect the coverage of the species. Um, you know, as you go further south and to the coast, the temperatures were a little less extreme, and we didn't have any effect. But from here, probably going north, um, we, we did see an impact on the on we satch. Um, some other trees to take note of um, are our are, are oak trees, our low live oaks and post oaks. And this was really surprising to us um, because a lot of them were impacted a lot more than what a lot of biologists thought. Um, we look at some of these species that are several hundred years old and some, you know, 500 plus years old, 
who have probably withstood, hope you would think many freezes like this in their lifetime. And we saw some mortality of our very old and mature oak trees, and at least a lot of damage to um, a lot of different oak trees. And that was very surprising to think a lot of foresters and biologists. Um, you know, right now the, the general thought is to give them time and that might be years for them to recover. Um, and you can see an example of the tree on the, on the right in this photograph. Um, we'll try to give it time, but there's a good chance it's, it's not going to survive. Um, well, the tree in the middle has obvious damage and it's, it's kind of stunted, but hopefully it will be able to overcome um, that freeze damage. Um, unfortunately, one thing that did happen in this area was we had um, a large caterpillar um, abundance. Oh, I think it was a month or so after the freeze, right when all of your leaves started blooming out and and the trees were doing well. And I, and I thought, okay, you know, it's, the trees are gonna have a break. Um, we had a large boom in caterpillars and they really damaged a lot of the leaves. And so when these trees were going through a stressful time of redding, trying to recover, they got hit with another punch um, from, from the caterpillars. And so I, I think that wasn't very helpful either for them. Um, so some of the conclusions that I have, um, I'd like to thank every, if anybody here um, participated in the effort to document on our iNaturalist or any other platform we had, some of the citizen science, citizen science approaches to document these effects. And I'd like to thank you all for that. And please watch for future opportunities. If we have other freeze events, if we have hurricanes or other natural disasters or things like that, or even just everyday opportunities. We have long-term projects with monarch butterflies and other um, species where you can record citizen science data. Um, please take the opportunity to do that because researchers and biologists across the country do look at those and um, it really helps us track the wildlife populations. It's one of the widespread ways we can document these populations. Um, <clears throat> And once again, I've said this many times, but it's going to be really hard to know the full impact of the storm. There's breeding bird surveys, um, Christmas bird counts. There are some long going um, population trends uh, surveys going on across the, the US that track some of the more easy to, to see species. Um, but you know, all we're gonna probably see is a is a little blip in that trend, and not really know what that number is over the long term. Um, once again, I touched on this, but we were going into spring, and spring greenup was happening, migration was happening when when this event happened, and so um, we've seen a trend um, over the past decades that spring is springing earlier and it's coming earlier and we actually had some spring green up in december mid to late december this year um when we used to think of that happening in march april or sometimes even may and and now that's happening earlier and earlier and if we have these cold events like we do it's going to kind of cause a collision of our natural system with that temperature that that's uh, you know probably wasn't seen until these last few decades. Um, so we hopefully won't see any more of these events, but it, it's possible that we'll see more of these events. Um, we do think most of these species are going to recover and are mildly affected. A lot of these species have multi multiple other challenges facing them as well, but um, we do think most of these species will recover. One benefit we did have is we had a fairly wet year um, throughout this summer and most of the year. So we kind of had the best opportunity that we had for those species to recover, um, you know, with the plants and animals and insects, we're probably given the best shot with the amount of rain that we had. If we would have went through a drought right after this, 
we probably would have had a, lo a, a lot, you know, longer recovery for some of these species. We get the plants to grow, then we get the insects to grow, and we build that building block for everything else to feed off of on that um, pyramid of the food chain. Um, with that, I'll take any questions you might have. I don't have any in the chat yet. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hey, I'm going to open up our mic on this end. We do have a question. Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned 27% uh, percent increase in spawning stock uh, biomass for the fish kills. Uh, to, is that something that the uh, state of Texas is doing? Is there, they're putting more fish in the, or is that? Yes. Just, uh, yeah, and so I'll give you a caveat that I'm not a fisheries biologist and I'm not in that program, but I've, I looked at some of our data and speaking points on this. And, uh, you know, most people may not realize it, but a large portion of the redfish, speckled trout, some flounder, and there's a few other species they're looking at, a large portion of those main game fish along the coast are stocked by Texas Parks and Wildlife from hatcheries. I've heard numbers as high as 40% of the redfish in the bays are actually hatchery fish. And so um, that population, those populations can be recovered a little bit more quickly um, by us, you know, increasing our capacity. Um, so I know it might be kind of shocking that some of those populations are, you know, that well supplemented, but you know, we think we can overcome that with, with what we're doing. Okay, thank you. I, I was just curious what exactly that was. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. We do have one question online and that's a question about, the, did you think the drought impacted the oaks, the oaks that were damaged? Um, and I guess referring to the previous year's drought? I would imagine, yes. Okay. Yes, I mean, that that could be part of it. Um, we've been through so many droughts in the past few years, it's hard to keep track of, um, of, of how many we've had. Um, but, you know, I think, yes, the trees might have been stressed going into that. It was a really dry winter before that event. Um, so, yes, they could have been highly stressed um, before the freeze event. But, you know, given that, I, th I think the freeze event was probably one of the, the biggest factors going, in, going into that. Um, the drought, the dry times before probably didn't help, but it was definitely the, the freeze that affected some of these trees and, and other plants. Mm -hmm. And then we did have a comment uh, just that from Sharon, she had a big Mexican honey wasp nest and it did okay. seven years old and it didn't make it. Yeah, I had one um, outside of my house too, and it's gone this year as well. So um, that was one species that we've um, looked at with the, having a northern expansion into this area, and it's probably going to have a southern recession because of um, because of the freeze. I don't have any other questions online. If unless somebody wants has something they'd like to ask now. Uh, let me see. Did we have one in the comments se section here? Okay. Okay. Yeah, you've got it. Um, all right. I think that is all our questions. And okay. our president is where's Mark? He's right here. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Thanks, Trent, very much for the input. I do note that uh, we did some bat rescue out in uh, Austin, and we had a couple thousand bats there that had fallen into the water and died. And from the, the bee population, our biggest impact from the cold was the impact of the cold had on the plants. And so the bees really battled through for food this year, but there was not much nectar or a pollen left in the plant after the trees. Yeah, that, that was something I was really going to touch on was it pushed our pollinators and a lot of our forbs 
back a month or more. Um, we did some monarch butterfly surveys um, and pollinator surveys at my office at the Nesloni Wallet Management Area a few weeks after the event. And um, we really couldn't count any plants at all. And that was uncharacteristic for, um, for that time of year for us, so yes. Well, thank you very much for your time. We're sorry that you were feeding under the weather and couldn't make it in person. That couple of people came in specifically to give you a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> I can see one of them over there with the white hair, so. <laughs> but uh, we appreciate the input and it was really interesting to realize how much the impact that's had on our populations and I okay. didn't realize it was and thank you all for having me sorry I couldn't be there in person I hope to see you all soon so. great thanks Trent all right and thank you I would like to start our business meeting a bit earlier. So let's just take uh, five minutes or so, eight minutes, and come back at. Uh, yeah, I had it muted. Uh, Mark said we'll we'll. Uh, start the meeting at 10 minutes till 8. Take a short break. And you can, you guys that are on, that are remote, you can turn your cameras on or turn your mics on, on if, you know, whatever you like to do during this part of the meeting. We'll leave the mic open also if anybody wants to interact. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. Yeah. 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 Yeah